Ladies and gentlemen, welcome. Thank you for joining us. We are going to be talking about why real estate, particularly buy and hold real estate, is so powerful. Our father has put it that it's the best way for someone of modest means to become independently wealthy. Uh, another quote I like is from Jacob Astor, who was the most wealthy person in the United States back in the early 20th century. He, he said, he was asked on his deathbed, what do you do if he could do it all over again? And just buy more, buy all of Manhattan. Don't stop. So uh, we did. We did just recently release a video about uh, the current economic for situation, where we're in a, as of the date of this video, in a deep recession. Uh, we also have a very volatile market, yet real estate continues to increase, and it's nobody very, knows yeah. why. So okay, yes. Overall, right now, caution is probably advised, but overall, buy and hold real estate is extremely powerful. And we think it's the, it's it's something that you should definitely consider doing if you're not doing, and if you are doing, maybe doing some more of. It's so powerful. We actually call it the ideal investment no. because that's our acronym. It's very cheesy. <laughs> this is an acronym. Anyways, we, I, I think we may have coined it. I, don't I, have I mean, no idea. I, I haven't heard anybody else use it other than us. So but anyways, we'll the did. ideal is an acronym. Uh, it stands for I D E A L, which is I income or the cash flow you get from a property. D depreciation. E, your equity builds up over time. A, appreciation, everybody's favorite thing in real estate. And then L, leverage. So we'll go over all of these. Andrew, you want to start off with income and I kind of will what that start. means? Income is just your cash flow. Any any cash flow you bring in from a property over and above your, your debt service and whatever expenses you have in operating the property. Now, a lot of people think of this like this is what they want. This is what they go into real estate for. Uh, I want to buy enough properties where I don't have to work anymore kind of thing. That's not really the approach you should have. Cash flow or income, it's the chair, it's on the top, it's the cherry on top. That's the way it should be seen. It's nice to have a lot of other investments done, a lot of stocks don't play dividends, a lot of you know bonds don't. Yeah, you don't get a lot. You of don't cash get any cash flow. In. Now you can't have negative cash flow, but if you buy right, you're going to have positive cash flow. But it's not going to be a huge amount for quite some time, especially if you have a debt until you pay that debt off. And uh, or if you don't go with debt at all, but that's a very conservative way you don't take yeah. advantage of some of these things. So, it's a nice Great thing to have a little bonus uh, until the end, but or until quite a ways down. Because overall, again, real estate is a get rich slow scheme. It's yes. not not quick. Uh, if somebody's selling you on how they're going to get, you're going to get rich quick in real estate. It's bogus. But it's the best get rich slow scheme, so to speak, that there is. And cash flow is a nice bonus on top, especially at the beginning, and it becomes nicer as time goes on. And a lot of people call buy and hold real estate like a passive income. I would never consider buy and hold real estate to be 100% passive. You mm -hmm. always have some management going on. Even if you have a management team you really trust and is really good, there's some management that's gonna take place of those assets and that cash flow. But it's a lot more passive than a job. Uh, in a lot of cases, you can make it fairly passive and it has a lot of benefits in terms of saving your time. It's not as passive as stocks, I would say, but uh, even stocks aren't 100% passive no. for the most part. So. Uh, the next one is depreciation. I'll talk about that. And this is really just a tax thing. Uh, basically, if you uh, buy real estate, you are allowed to depreciate the value of that real estate on your taxes and, in some cases, not pay income tax on uh, profit or income you've had. So the United States government, in all their wisdom, decided to pick the weirdest number they could think of, which was 27 and a half. Could and so. Pie. I guess that's a little, that's irrational. Though. <laughs> but uh, they picked a very strange number, 27 and a half. And for commercial real estate, it was 39. 39. So they picked two different numbers. But if you have a rental house, you can take the value of that rental house. Let's take a, a value like $275,000. That's a good number, a good number to pick. So every year you get to depreciate, what would that be, $10,000 mm -hmm. off of the value of the house. And then you don't have to pay income taxes on that. Now, there are some stipulations about that. Uh, if you are an active real estate investor then you get to depreciate any active income you have, which would be your real estate income or income from a job or something like that. You get to depreciate your active income by that $10,000 for 27 and a half years. You get to depreciate that and not pay income taxes on it. Now, if you are have a job and have real estate on the side, you can't do quite the same thing and just depreciate uh, passive income, which your real estate would then become against your active job income. But you can depreciate like to like. So active income can depreciate it with active assets that you have and passive income can be depreciated with passive. And, and the requirements for being, being an active real estate investor is just that you have to spend a certain amount of time being in real estate, yeah. doing your real estate work. You can't just buy it and sit and let it be there. And so that's something to talk to. There's some definitions about, about that. I'm not a hundred percent clear on what they are. So now but. when you, uh, when you sell a property, you do have to recapture those gains and pay capital gains tax on them, but you can 
uh, you can transfer those on, but you can do what's called a 1031 exchange. Maybe we'll have another video on this sometime where you can ex we can take those gains and put them into another property and you can continue to defer those taxes. And even if, if you eventually, once you pass away, the basis would go back to uh, what it was and you wouldn't have any taxes to pay and you can transfer it on to your heirs. So those are some strategies that you can take advantage of to kind of continue deferring taxes, paying, you know, if you have 10,000, even if you're a passive investor, you make $10,000 cash flow from your property, you have $10,000 depreciation, yeah. you have zero income tax to pay. Yes, you have to pay your property taxes, but zero income tax to pay. And property taxes should be built into your I income when you yes. buy the investment in the first place. Uh, equity buildup, E, Andrew, you want equity to go over that Equity buildup is, is actually, this is what first got our father interested in real estate in the beginning. It was just looking at an amortization table of paying down principal over time on a bank loan. And, and any real estate investor, unless you're going very conservative and going without loans, should be trying to get a bank loan and long-term debt on a property as soon as possible. Yes, private money is great for buying up front, uh, hard money occasionally, but you want to get loans, bank loans, long-term debt where you're paying down principal every month. And uh, yes, most of it is not most of it's going to go to the interest, especially on a 30-year amortization. If you get a 20-year or 15-year amortization, you pay the loan off of over 15 or 20 years, you'll, have, uh, you'll pay more principal and less interest each month. But the nice part is, in a lot of markets, particularly in the Midwest and the South, uh, the Rust Belt, where you can, you can find properties in you know, working class, lower middle class areas where you know, you're cash flowing over and above your expenses and your debt service, and, you're, and so you're basically you're basically, and you're also basically paying less than you would in in, in rent, yeah, um, or or very close to that. And so you're paying. It's like paying rent, except for your every month you're paying a little bit of principal down. It might only be eight, ten percent of your payment, but it accelerates and over it's time. Every year counts. you pay more and more principal and less and less. Interest. You look back in twenty years and you go, oh wait, I got a lot of equity mm -hmm. that I paid over the years, and you know you're forced to do it, and it, it really helps. And it's get rich yeah. slow scheme. It's just kind yeah. of what it is. Real estate is get rich slow scheme. Yeah. yeah. Um, a appreciation. This is the one that gets everybody jazzed about real estate. It's probably made more re uh, millionaires and even billionaires in real estate than any of these other things. Um, it's the one me and Andrew are actually not the most excited about, but it generally uh, does the most for people in a lot of different ways. Basically, real estate over the last hundred years and more has gone up in value consistently over time. Now. It's yeah. Some of that is kind of hidden in the fact that the value of your dollar is losing value all the time. Mm -hmm. uh, inflation keeps happening, and real estate is a hedge against that inflation. Mm -hmm. So, you know, what yeah. is typical inflation? It, it's well, real estate's gone up about four point six percent per yeah. year since I think the nineteen fifties. Real appreciation has been a little bit less than that, and or I mean inflation. And really, this could be ideal <laughs> um, because the uh, appreciation technically refers to like forced appreciation. Yeah. Doing something to the property, like uh, adding a swimming pool or converting a garage or something like that, or, or you know, doing something that improves the value of the property. It's forced appreciation, or perhaps something happens in your local area that drastically increases the value path of the property. progress, something like that. Yeah, path yeah. of progress, gentrification, new jobs come in, but so it's really just inflation. But generally speaking, I mean, we have a growing population. It's expected to continue to grow. Perhaps that won't happen. You need to take that into account. But if it does continue to grow, we are likely going to continue to see appreciation over the long run. There'll be ups, there'll be downs, but appreciation over the long run, probably a little bit above inflation. But even if it's, oh yeah, just taking this account, you got your equity buildup is going up exponentially. Your appreciation also goes up exponentially because if it goes up 5%, you have a $100,000 property, 100,000 to 105, 5% 5 of 105,000 is a little bit more than that. So you yeah. appreciation is going up exponentially and uh, equity buildup is going up exponentially. And so, really, you know, you don't have linear growth. You have it's not a it's not a hugely slanted curve, but it is slanted yeah. fairly well. Now, the thing is, everybody gets like I said, everybody's super excited about the appreciation aspect that's made a bunch of millionaires over time. But it's the thing that you can't unless you're doing forced appreciation. Yeah. It's the thing you can't rely on. It's a bit speculative. Yes, if and you're so, just buying solely for appreciation, you're just speculating. In general, you can trust it, mm -hmm. but you should never trust it in a micro aspect. You should never overextend yourself Absolutely. based off of appreciation possibly happening by a, an investment because you're like, if it appreciates, I'm gonna be a millionaire. But if it doesn't, then you're losing money every month. That's not a good idea. Now, one nice so, part about the appreciation, the inflation or appreciation of real estate, we move into the L. And this is that even if it appreciates at a lower rate of low than the than the inflation rate, you're still gaining quite a return because of leverage. Yeah. So if you have a $100,000 property 
you put twenty thousand dollars down, you have an eighty thousand dollar loan. It goes up five percent. So the property's now worth one hundred five thousand. You didn't make five percent on your money though. You only put twenty thousand down. You made uh, twenty five percent yeah. on your money. Just and huge which is, return. Which is a huge return. It's an enormous return. And so by using leverage, you can drastically increase the return that you get. Um, now, of course, any wise viewer, and I hope you are one, would notice that that's, that can go, that can buy you. Other way too, 2008, yes. it bit a lot of people, yes. bit Bear Stearns and Lehman Brothers and a few others, Toll Brothers, it, but there's a way to mitigate that risk if you're a wise, active investor, particularly if you're an active investor, especially if you're uh, yes. wise, and that is the, another added value of, of real estate, and that is that real estate is a inefficient market. Now, the stock market is considered efficient. This isn't completely true. Obviously, it's I'm, mostly efficient, it's but it's not very perfect. hard to beat the market. Everyone has all the information. They can go to you know e trade and just type in a thing and do a trade. Now that's not you know Warren Buffett can still beat the market. I don't think it's completely efficient. It's obviously not efficient in terms of they all know what they're doing. Otherwise, two thousand eight wouldn't have happened. <laughs> <laughs> but generally, it's very 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 hard for for you to beat the market, especially since like experts can barely beat the market if they even can. You're not going to. I just I, I'll just break it to you. spoilers. You will not beat the market, but in real estate, the market there is this general market, but there's also this specific market. Every house is yeah. its own. This is kind of where we're going. Monopoly, we're going past the ideal to something else entirely, and that's it, the, the main reason for it is what people consider to be the biggest disadvantage of real estate, and that is that it's illiquid. Yeah, it's hard to sell it. You can't. You can sell a stock like that. You can't. Real estate can take three months, six months, whatever. But that means you got motivated sellers. You got things like that need to sell now, and they can give you a discount. You've got deals where you can get where they're not on the market. You act, you know, you do uh, do a mailing campaign, do search engine optimization, do do other ways to get in front of people. Whatever you need. Find somebody yeah. who you know, an out of state absentee owner who doesn't want to deal with this house. It's dilap. You know, they'll they'll sell. They give sweat it equity. Just use yeah. a bunch of sweat equity to force the presentation. No such, I mean, property. they're dipl dilapidated companies that like corporate raiders can buy and sell for parts. But you're not going to do that. <laughs> Whereas you can do that as a real estate investor. You get a dilapidated property and do a value add, or you can do a value add that's more like, okay, well, this like for example, we'll do a video on student housing sometime. Uh, one of the things our father did, we mentioned him a lot in this one, is when he got started in real estate, he'd buy a house that was kind of that was seen as a family rental, and he'd turn into a student rental. Which is all about bedrooms. You can for more, add bedrooms. You do forced depreciation yeah. to increase the income over time as equity buildup happened. You use leverage to buy all the property and you depreciate yeah. on taxes and didn't have to pay income tax, so you used it all. But what this means is two things. The first one is you can get built in equity. Not not equity built built in. You yeah. can get you, by just by purchasing property, you can add to your bottom line. You buy that property for a hundred thousand worth, you buy it for eighty, or our aim we try to be in for seventy five percent. Seventy five, we made twenty five thousand dollars right off the bat. Come back to this L puppy. This is where you can mitigate the risk of leverage by getting that good deal. So first of all, you have built-in equity right off the bat. So you buy a property for, let's say it's worth 120,000, you buy it for 100,000. Right off the bat, you made $20,000. Yeah. So that's a big, big game. You're into 100, you have a $80,000 loan. So you put 20,000 into it. I learned a lot of numbers here. But anyways, it goes up from 120 to $125,000. You've made $5,000 uh, on your, you know, on on your balance sheet, so to speak. Now, now you have a 25% gain because you you're only into it for $20,000. But if it goes down $5,000 from 120 to 115,000, you're only into it for 100. You've lost nothing. Yeah. You still have a $15,000 gain. So all of a sudden, the, the the disadvantages of leverage, that two-edged sword, it's been blunted on one You're side. You're insulated yeah. against the risk. You can't do that with stocks in the same way. Yeah. You can't do that with a lot of investments. You can insulate yourself by by buying it with that value already. Where if you are, Now, if 2008 happens and things are down 50%, maybe you can't isolate or insulate against that much downfall, but don't overextend even, yeah. yourself. If, you know? if you, yeah, if, even if you insulate against most of it, you can probably write it out. A lot yes. of the investors who and insulated if, themselves pretty well. If it's cash flowing it anyways, and you have yeah. a good tenant in there, then you don't even, you can just write out the whole thing if you want to. Yeah, absolutely. So leverage really builds on this whole thing because, I mean, people with modest means and stuff like that, they can't put half a million dollars in the stock market to make a 10% return or whatever they're trying to make, but you can buy a rental house for a modest amount of money and take advantage of all these aspects and build a so, substantial amount of wealth with a modest means in the yeah. beginning. And, so. and 
There's other things you can use to take advantage of this. We'll do some videos on getting started, FHA loans, house hacking, things to look into. Um, but yes, the ideal uh, acronym, income depreciation, equity buildup, appreciation and leverage, and then add in buying, you know, an inefficient market. You can buy good deals, get built in equity right off the bat and also insulate yourself from the risk of leverage by doing so. So it's a great investment, it's something to consider getting into if you haven't, and if you are, consider getting into more. Uh, but I think we should call it a do for this Well, movie. you know what the L should stand for? should stand for like, because you gotta like this video, and then subscribe to the channel, and then make sure to follow us on Snapchat, because we don't have a Snapchat. So that's what I'm gonna end the video The rest with. of them, yeah, YouTube, <laughs> YouTube, right. Facebook, Instagram. Thanks guys, we'll see you again soon. Hope you appreciated it.